Hi everyone, I'm Robert Jolly. I use he, him pronouns. I am a product manager with uh, 18F, which is a part of the GSA's technology transformation service. And I'm based in Fort Collins, Colorado. So I'll get us started with talking through our agenda and then we'll introduce uh, our co-panelists as well. So we'll have introductions next. Um, then uh, Pia will give an inclusive design and accessibility overview and um, accessibility research framework. Um, I'll give uh, some information about the TTS Accessibility Guild and things we've been doing. So some highlights of our, of our work over the past couple of years. And then we'll talk about inclusive research and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So today, I think what we'd like to come away with is, is some ideas around how might we design and work with people with disabilities instead of for them? And how might we embed inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, otherwise uh, termed as idea in our cultural DNA? And uh, how might we recognize exclusion at each stage of the development, uh, as well as the hiring process? So how do, we, um, how do we do these things? And how can we um, bring people with disabilities into our processes instead of um, being kind of um, a recipient of, of, our, of our work? So let's um, start with some introductions. Um, on the screen, we have three photos uh, of me on the left, Robert Jolly, Ben Peterson in the middle, and Pia Zaragoza on the right. Um, my title is, uh, uh, well, I'm a product manager at TTS and at 18F, and um, I am the former Accessibility Guild co-lead at uh, TTS. I'll turn it over to you, Ben. Hi, this is uh, Ben Peterson speaking. Um, I'm the Technology Transformation Service, uh, or TTS, Research Guild co-lead and a UX designer uh, with 18F. Uh, I'll pass that to Pia. Hi, this is Pia Zaragoza speaking. Um, I'm currently the TTS Accessibility Guild co-lead and I'm a Presidential Innovation Fellow. And for those of you who are not familiar with this program, um, it's just pairing industry with federal change makers. Um, and we just finished all the interviews for the 2022 cohort, or not interviews, but applications, but just know that the 2023 uh, cohort will be opening up in the near future. So shout out to Presidential Innovation Fellow Program. All right, thank you, Pia. Okay, we're moving on to the next slide. We're on slide number six. Uh, for those of you who will um, potentially follow along at home uh, with the slide deck that we'll provide after this, um, we're gonna talk a little bit um, about the overview. So um, I'll give it back to Pia. Thank you, Robert. This is Pia speaking. On this slide, you see one out of five people identify as being disabled and four out of five people care about someone with a disability. And what that means is, is that everyone is impacted. And these are just powerful words from a disability activist, Christina Milan. And so uh, for our friends who love numbers, the Center for Disease Control published in 2019 that 61 million Americans have a disability. And when you do times four, that means that there are 244 million Americans that are impacted. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and go to slide number eight. So when we talk about disability, um, just know that it can be situational, it can be temporary, um, and the different types of disabilities are cognitive, auditory, speech, mobility, and vision. And there's a a GIF on this slide and you see people of different abilities. And the other thing I wanna call out is that sometimes it's not just that you have one, you could also have a range of different abilities or several ones at a time. So I uh, just wanna make sure to call that out. So we're gonna go ahead and jump to slide nine to go over some key terms. What you see on the slide is three different definitions, one being universal design. And just so that we're all using the same language, um, this is a term that actually started off in architecture. And it's the notion that it, 
that design is usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. And you also see inclusive design. And what's interesting about inclusive design is that it's been, it, it really starts to encompass digital spaces as well as physical spaces. And it's all about advancing accessibility as well as encompassing the full range of human diversity, which includes not just ability, but language, culture, gender, as well as age. And then there's digital accessibility which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the principles later, which is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And it's all about a person's ability to do, um, per to perceive, uh, operate, and understand and the robustness of technology um, as it relates to a product service, as well as an environment. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and jump into slide number 10. And here you see, inclusive design principles. There's seven here um, and you see different imagery um, that kind of illustrates the different principles um, on the computer as well as mobile devices. And so the first principle is provide a comparable experience. The second principle is give control. And three is offer choice. And then four is consider the situation five is be consistent, and six is prioritize content, and seven is add value. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to actually apply this, especially in the UX work, but I also just want to call out um, uh, something that we kind of talked about earlier before this session started is, what does it mean to be a designer? And a designer, as well as researcher, is anybody who um, is making a decision. You have to design a solution. And then in the context of research, um, someone brought up it's anybody who asks questions. So whether or not UX is directly related to your role or indirectly related to your to this role, we hope that you find something valuable, um, especially in recognizing exclusion. And with that, um, I just wanted to share in slide 11 some interesting principles from the Design Justice Network. And here you see a visual of the different uh, design justice principles. Um, and I want to call out something, especially the work that is happening um, at TTS as well as GSA in the different guilds. Um, it's been so exciting being a part of government. I joined um, last October in 2020. And the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility momentum is so exciting. And, you know, it's also part of the inspiration, motivation, and provocation of this talk, um, designing for, uh, not for, but with people of all abilities, as opposed to for. And these design justice principles are really powerful. And especially in diversity guild accessibility, as well as research guilds, a lot of what we talk about is how, and, and also I'm sure Rachel, um, who is who just presented, Dykus, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't butcher your last name, you know, also talked about um, trauma-informed um, as well as, uh, I know that there's also some ethics involved and so forth and so on, but I wanna kind of humanize this for a second. Um, and what it actually means to design for, excuse me, with people of all abilities. And so in this framework, it's all about using design to sustain, heal, and empower. It's about centering voices. It's about prioritizing design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. Um, we view change as an emergent from accountable, accessible, and collaborative process. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the collaborative process in a second. But then most importantly, we see the role of a designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. And then we also believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience. And we all have a unique and brilliant contributions to the design process. And then we share knowledge and tools with our communities. And like I said, there's been so much bubbling um, up in the different guilds that I hope to bring to light today, as well as Ben and Robert. And we work towards sustainable community-led and controlled outcomes. And we work towards non-exploitive solutions that reconnect us. And then before seeking new design solutions, we already look for what is working. And so 
these are just um, some themes, as I mentioned, from the design uh, principles, rather, from the Design Justice Network that I feel like have embodied a lot of the conversations that we're having internally. And with that, we're, let's go ahead and go to slide number 12. So for some of you, um, when we talk about designing with, what does that actually mean and how do you actually do this? Um, there's something, uh, this is a graphic from Beyond Sticky Notes. And what I love about it, this is they talk about co-production. Oftentimes you hear participatory methods floating around as well as co-design, but actually this work is more than just co-design. Um, and in this graphic, it, it highlights the fact that there's co-planning, there's co-designing, there's co-delivery and co-evaluation. And so this is the, the, the notion of co-production. And so with this, it's all about the fact that participatory design and research, as well as inclusive design and research and accessibility is all about prioritizing relationships, empowering the community in order to build capacity, but also share power. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Robert to kind of talk a little bit about legislation policy, as well as policy. Thanks, Pia. So we're on slide 13 now. Um, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about legislation and policy and, and why that matters to us in government, um, as well as, uh, you know, potentially folks outside of government. So, uh, of course, we have the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, and Section 508, which I believe is a part of that Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And we hear a lot about Section 508 in our government work, especially around um, digital properties, things that we're working on, software and machines that, that we're, we're using, you know, is it Section 508 compliant? Is it accessible? Um, we've got the um, Americans with Disabilities Act and, um, and then also the 21st Century Video and Communications Act. That's um, uh, along with the Air Carrier Access Act. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with that one, but those two um, are are laws that um, that do affect uh, you know private industry outside of government. So the Air Carrier Access Act, I can speak a little bit more about uh, because I um, am pretty familiar with it. But that uh, was a directive in I believe 2012 for all of the major air carriers in um, in the U.S. or operating in the U.S to provide accessible websites um, and accessible booking engines uh, and experiences digitally for people with disabilities. So that was a major act. Uh, we have a new one called the 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act or 21st or 21C IDEA as it's often um, abbreviated. And that uh, affects uh, executive agencies, executive branch agencies, to make all of their digital properties um, uh, be not only accessible, but uh, use modern principles. And they have a number of uh, requirements for us as executive branch agencies like the GSA. Um, with that, uh, we'll um, We'll go to the um, to the next slide, um, which uh, we have a title up here: D E I and A or Idea. So um, you know we want to talk a little bit about inclusion and and what that is. Um, we want to make sure that everyone feels welcomed and valued. Um, the, the the opposite of exclusion, right? Um, diversity. We want to celebrate all of the different ways that 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 we are. You know the ways that we differ. Um, we can bring valuable perspectives to, um, to any system if we allow it to be diverse. Uh, having, um, having opportunity to fully participate is what equity is about, right? So um, you can have diver some diversity, some inclusion, some equity, but without accessibility, without including everyone, um, including pe all people with disabilities um, and, and making an accessible experience, you don't really have true diversity, equity, or inclusion. You have partial, I think, but, um, but a lot of times accessibility gets kind of left out. And we do see now an uptick in, um, in DE&I efforts to include accessibility, and we celebrate that, and we, we really applaud that, and that's happening um, quite a bit right now. 
So I'll turn it back over to uh, Pia to talk about uh, applying accessibility principles in UX. All right, so we're on slide 15 now and going to slide 16. And what you see in slide 16 is this really amazing graphic produced by the Ontario Canadian government on who is typically excluded. Um, ben Peterson will also talk about this a little bit more and how to actually, and, and just some ideas on how to actually um, start to kind of approach this work. Um, but what's really interesting, which we'll talk a little bit about later, is that so much about this, about, about this work is ability, identity, habits, and preferences. And especially when it comes to identity, which we'll talk about soon, there's so much dimensionality. So to say, you know, just people with disabilities, um, you know, there's, there's also other layers. So for instance, there's seniors an aging population. There's remote and rural and locale. There's gender, um, you know, there's also immigrants and disabilities and, and also racialized. And then the LGBT, the LGBTQIA plus, plus two spirit, uh, low income, and then low literacy as well as indigenous populations. And so just some things to, uh, to also consider as you're doing this work. And with each, uh, and, what, and what is also on the screen are the different icons representing um, all these different categories that I mentioned on who is typically excluded. Um, and so in moving to slide 17, we're gonna go ahead and dissect UX a little bit. So the term UX stands for user experience. And when you break that down even further, um, what you're actually looking for as a intern when you're doing this work as a designer or researcher um, is when it comes to users, you're trying to design and research behaviors, needs, and motivations. And then when it comes to experience, it's all about ensuring it's usable, useful, delightful. But what we're really emphasizing in this talk is accessible. Um, and that is um, what we'll talk about that more in a second as it relates to the accessibility principles. And especially in the work that I have done um, in artificial intelligence, as well as machine learning, as well as all of these new emerging technologies that are pretty nascent, the one thing that becomes even more important is context. And there's just a lot of interesting um, shifts in this space on how to actually go about the work and understanding the context. Um, but I wanna put it out there, especially when you're thinking about people of all abilities, it's also important to also consider their beliefs, their desires and intent. And with that, um, just to kind of explain a little bit more on the screen and the way this information is displayed, you see concentric circles with user on one end as well as experience and then the center is context. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and go to slide 18. So one of the joys of being a Presidential Innovation Fellow is getting to do research on research um, as part of my 20% project. Um, when I'm not doing um, this work, I, I have the joy of also um, doing CX research at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency at the Department of Homeland Security, which is also doing amazing work around accessibility. So just wanna shout out to DHS as well. But and some of the research that I have done um, is really how do we actually go about applying all of this? Like that's such a mouthful, right? Accessibility principles and then there's standards and then there's UX and how does this all come together, right? So earlier when we were talking about the definition of accessibility, there are four principles that I mentioned, which is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And in a second, we're going to talk about how to how this all blends in. Um, and then there's standards, which is conformance, compliance, and governance. And, and Robert, um, do you want to add to that? To the accessibility and standards piece? Sure. Um, so this is Robert uh, speaking. Uh, you know, the there are standards that exist that um, that really try very hard to align with um, with the principles of accessibility. Um, and those those standards, um, like the W3C's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, 
the ones that Section 508 now align to, um, allow us to, um, to check our work as it is. So we can, we can kind of test things out and say, do these, do these things um, meet the standards that we know of? Um, you know, and, and can, we, can we test this work? So um, really the standards are there not to, um, not to just check a box, um, although some people do that and, and that's not what we encourage. What they are there to do is, is to try to say, have we missed anything? Are we, are we, are we um, leaving in any barriers or, or putting up barriers to access, um, making things less perceivable, less operable, less understandable or less robust? So those standards exist to, um, to kind of keep us in check. Awesome, thank you so much. And so with that, what does this all mean, right? How do you actually apply the accessibility framework to your UX, CX and human factors practice? So here are some considerations in slide 19. And so in slide 19, what is here is the different definitions, but Amy Hurst of the NYU Ability Project has really done an amazing job of narrowing this down to ability habits and preferences, but especially what we have seen in government, uh, especially in the different guilds, the design, um, the research accessibility, as well as the diversity guild is the, also the importance of including identity. So this is a contribution from uh, the different guilds and, and as well as um, what we've seen in government. And so with that said, um, when you're doing this work, it's so important to consider ability. Um, and what that means is having the power, skill, means, or opportunity to do something. And that also extends to assistive technology. Um, and assistive technology, um, you know, think about it as a tool. Um, and the ultimate goal is independence, or in some cases, interdependence, and helping individuals achieve that. Um, and then identity is all about the qualities, beliefs, personality, looks, and or expressions that make a person or group habits, which is trigger behaviors in which we engage without conscious awareness or deliberate control, as well as preferences, evaluations concerning matters of value, typically in relation to practical reasoning. And so what's so, so important is, you know, we talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, but this is really about humanizing the experience. And to humanize the experience, um, this is just some research that has come up and especially to help frame this work. And so now we're gonna go ahead and transition to slide 20, which is all about operate, operationalizing accessibility in UX. And so we're going to go ahead and transition into slide 21 about accessibility zones. Now, the reason why I bring up operationalizing um, UX is, you know, we talk about principles, but actually, but how do you actually get started? And so um, Ben, as well as Robert are going to talk about some highlights that's on what's actually been started and what's actually being done. But I, I wanna help frame a little bit about where this is all coming from. So accessibility zones is something that Sherry Byrne Haber came up with. And it's this notion is oftentimes when we approach this work around accessibility, it sometimes comes from fear, especially in industry. Um, sometimes we hear about lawsuits um, related to ADA or the lack thereof of ADA in Section 508. Um, but in government, I wouldn't say there's so much as fear. Um, I think it's just more about what we'll talk about in a little bit, which is more about stakeholder commitment. Um, and then there's the learning aspect and then there's the growth aspect. And so in transitioning and, and sorry, just to explain what's on the screen, you see three triangles with fear, learning and growth, all pointing um, in the direction of the right. Um, and then in going to slide 22, um, you see a breakdown of these uh, triangles. Um, and once again, instead of fear, you see stakeholder commitment. Instead of learning, you see training. And then instead of growth, you see scaling. And so, you know, the hardest part, as we all know, is getting started. And luckily, there's amazing resources from ADA, Section 508, as well as different organizations and institutions. Um, but I want to say that getting the stakeholder commitment, which we're so lucky in TTS and GSA 
shout out to Dave Z, as well as all the people who came before him who have really set us up for success. Um, but, and then of course, all the different guilds who support this work and, and actually get it going. But I hope this provides you with just um, a way to start kind of thinking about where you are and where you wanna be. And um, with that, there's this concept of accessibility maturity models, which we see now in slide 23. And slide 23, 24, and 25, we're going to talk about just some interesting viewpoints as, around accessibility maturity models. And so in slide 23, um, you see this graphic from level access, which um, highlights that the first thing is getting this work initialized, and then, of course, moving on to management of it and then definition and then of course measuring impact and quantitatively managed and then optimizing and then when we move to slide 24 um what you see here is just another way of thinking about it especially in the context of ux and this is once again an accessibility maturity model that neil and i'm sorry for butchering his last name milliken uh kind of came up with which is a framework to assess and address inclusion issues as it's defined by and what you see on this graphic is these different swim lanes of informal, defined, repeatable, managed, and optimized. And all of this is all about reducing the risk of disability discrimination. Um, and then on slide 25, it's the accessibility evolution model as presented by Microsoft. And, you know, what's really excited about government is, you know, there's definitely, you know, we have a history of getting started in this space and building momentum as well as being innovators in accessibility. And just wanna shout out to the work at 10X, um, which is all about um, turning ideas uh, and, and into actual, um, in, uh, turning ideas into reality, which is so exciting to have these incubators and accelerators. And that really, you know, is one way of driving change outside of legislation and policy. And just throwing it back to Robert, is there anything that you want to add? Um, you know, uh, it's okay to be where you are in, uh, in terms of, um, you, you know, your organization's maturity. Uh, with accessibility, but um, taking stock of, um, of, of where you sit with, um, with accessibility maturity and, and where you, you can go as an organization is a really good first step or, or step along the way to, um, to kind of plotting out what, um, what you want to do and, and, how, and what you need to get there. So I would say, you know, uh, don't be worried if you are in a, um, a getting started stage, or you still need to get stakeholder buy-in or commitment on this. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a process and, uh, and, you know, it takes time. Thank you for that, Robert. We're gonna go ahead and go to slide 26, which is nothing about us without us. It's a quote that is on the screen and it's a popular slogan actually by disability activists. And the reason why we also bring this up is the whole entire theme is when we're doing the designing and research, we talked about co-production, but then in slide 27, we start to talk about disability inclusion in the workplace. And just so, so excited about, especially with TTS and GSA, um, about how we're approaching this and doing more in this space. We've recently started publishing jobs in different platforms like inclusively but then of course there's also source america uh pete which robert please help me with this pete is the partnership for employee accessibility uh what does the acronym stand for again robert I don't know that I can answer that one uh, accurately. Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but Pete is actually the partnership on employment, accessibility, and technology. Sorry. There you go. And then Ability One. And then, of course, you also have Section 508 and ADA. But the reason why I bring this out, I bring this up, is because you know so much about this work is community. Um, and bringing the community in through not just design and research efforts, but also to make them part of the federal workforce. So just wanna put that out there. 
Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to um, Robert for slide 28. And by the way, sorry, just to describe what is on slide 27, you see the different logos of Inclusively, Source America, um, PEAT, as well as Ability One, Section 508, and ADA. So going to go ahead and turn this over to Robert for the TTS Accessibility Guild highlights starting on slide 28. All right. Hi. Um, thanks, Pia. So um, in the Technology Transformation Service of the GSA, we have an Accessibility Guild, but you may be wondering, what is this? So um, we, uh, we help Technology Transformation Service uh, develop good, accessible products from the start of production in order to provide an excellent user experience for everyone. Now that comes from the TTS handbook that is uh, widely published. So if you um, if you use your search engine of choice, you could Google um, or you could search for uh, uh, TTS handbook. And, and uh, there's a lot more than just uh, the work of the guilds, but this is what we have on the guild. But um, you know, what does that mean and, and uh, what do we do? So we, um, we are an informal uh, group of TTS employees who um, spend time supporting each other in, um, in our various um, uh, needs for and journey for accessibility. So we share insights in a, in a dedicated Slack channel. We have a, a meeting that happens um, that's an organized meeting every two weeks on Fridays where we bring in speakers or we select a topic and we have presentations and, and, and uh, work together to improve the, um, the approach that we take to accessibility. Uh, we, we really try to, um, to expand uh, everyone's knowledge about accessibility and how we can do inclusive design in a, in a much more efficient and better way. Um, so we, we try to be that, that support network. Um, and one of the things that, that we noticed along the way is that, um, that, that we, we have kind of a, a longstanding problem and that's that um, TTS employees uh, really do care about accessibility. I've, I've never seen someone just be dis dismissive of it, but, um, but folks don't have a complete toolkit for building accessible products. Now, the Accessibility Guild has, has produced different things along the way to help with that, but, um, but you know, folks come from, um, from all over uh, the private sector and all over government to join TTS. And, and, um, and so we find folks that uh, may not have been exposed to accessibility requirements in, in, in their work yet. Um, so, um, so folks uh, you know, kind of need that. Um, We've um, we've also done a few other things uh, we to to address this. So um, the alley the Slack bot is a very new um, initiative. So uh, we all use Slack at TTS for internal communications, and um, and so we created a bot that. Um, can be filled with responses to uh, frequently asked questions or random questions even. Um, so this, uh, this is a, an image of uh, a woman of color in a wheelchair and, um, and then uh, the Slack logo is, um, is next to her. And uh, basically Ali the Slack bot will respond um, with, um, with answers when you, when you have questions and can also direct you to um, to dedicated resources for help, say if you need to audit a, a workflow or something like that. So um, so back to that that problem that we had around um, folks um, needing a more kind of complete understanding and toolkit. Um, you know there were some possible solutions, a, a lot of them actually, and so many that they kind of roll off the, the page. But um, I'll go through a few of these. You know, hiring more people with disabilities. Of course, we want that, right? Um, we want this diverse representation of disabilities at TTS. Um, we could develop an inclusive design toolkit, a lot like Microsoft. Um, we, um, we can do more user research with the disability community. And that is something that, um, that, that Ben has been working on quite a bit um, with, uh, with his, um, his UX research work, um, you know, including uh, people with disabilities in our usability testing processes and practices. 
um, we can do ma more manual accessibility testing because folks, um, you know, generally um, don't feel um, confident enough or, or or equipped enough to to do that. And um, you know, and that's uh, you know, Section 508 or WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guideline audits. Um, we could have more comprehensive automated testing tools, um, have role-based guidance for all TTSers. Uh, we sort of have that with um, accessibility for teams at, um, at accessibility.digital.gov, which is um, a really great resource that, that folks uh, prior to my joining TTS had uh, stood up as a part of the Accessibility Guild. Um, we could have on-demand uh, web content accessibility guideline audits for products and embed accessibility uh, subject matter experts on each team. So there's all these possibilities, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, dimming out all of the ones that, um, that we, we just couldn't narrow on, but we worked on something and that is, um, uh, making a class for uh, manual accessibility testing so that we could have more staff who could do audits, who could basically check their work as they're going. So um, do self-checks, not, um, not building pieces of a product or a product itself and then take it to an accessibility team to check. But how do we train the folks that are, that are in, the, you know, in the field doing the work, building products to, um, to test their own work? So, um, so I paired up with uh, Nikki Lee from 18F and Dave Stanger from USA.gov. And we uh, worked um, a lot of piecemeal hours, um, an hour here, an hour there. We would, we would um, beg, borrow, and steal time to work on this course. And we developed an eight-week course for teaching teams at TTS how to manually test a product in accordance with WCAG 2 and 2.1 um, level uh, AA. So, um, for those of you that are not familiar with the standards, uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 is the is the um, Section 508 um, uh, standard at, at level AA. So they have three different levels: A, AA, and AAA. And then um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines came out with um, the um, version 2.1 which added a few success criteria, a few testable scenarios um, uh, to that. So we're calling it section 508 plus basically is, is what we're teaching to. Um, and, uh, and so we had, a, we had a couple of goals with the training. Um, our first goal was to teach everyone how to run a basic pre-check-in audit of a code change. So, you know, before you make that commit, um, you know, how, how can you test this, right? So test this stuff. And then our second goal was to teach everyone how to run a full WCAG assessment of a product. And, um, and so we learned some things um, and, and, you know, we had eight volunteers to, to pilot the class. I'll talk about the class first, well, then I'll talk about the learnings, but, um, and that was good. Um, it, it turned out well, but I'm showing a, a basically a slide here from the course uh, about how screen readers read the underlying HTML. And um, and our our slide um, kind of shows um, the HTML on the left with a paragraph uh, talking about otters. I'm not going to read the whole thing. And then um, a, an image uh, tag with an, an alt attribute saying African clawless otter displaying webbed feet. And then we show the display, how it displays in the browser on the right with the paragraph of text and the picture underneath it. Um, that's all great. And then we even had another slide, which I don't have in this deck, I, I should have, but um, it shows what the screen reader output would be and how it reads out the image where it would read African clawless otter displaying webbed feet image. And so um, we give people kind of a, a taste of here's what the experience is. And um, we also talk about, you know, making design choices. So how, how can we have folks thinking, um, you know, uh, more in advance, like when they're making these design choices, how can, how can you accommodate folks with, um, you know, with vision disabilities that isn't, you know, say total blindness using a screen reader, but um, having a low vision issue. So um, we are illustrating on this slide what full color vision with text on top of an image might look like against monochromacity, uh, which, you know, like using something in grayscale, they're both way 
too poor of contrast with this text on top of the image. And we're using that to just illustrate how do design choices affect people's ability to, um, uh, you know, to perceive or operate um, the content that we have. Um, another course slide goes into what are the landmark roles and what do they mean for folks? So we have um, a section at the top with the role of banner, uh, the role of navigation just under the banner, a role of main for the main content, role of complementary, which is in the side content uh, in, a, in a page or a web app, and then the content info, which is generally the footer information. And that's one way that a person with a disability may choose to, um, to navigate a web page or to get around um, and jump to content more quickly. Um, I want to talk about how it turned out. So we had those two goals, right, of, of um, having people feel comfortable doing a quick check-in, uh, you know, like check of their work before they check in code and, um, and also doing a, um, a full audit. And um, what we found out is that everyone, um, first off, we, we kept everyone's interest. Everyone consistently showed up to class, ease, even when their schedules were tight. So one of the things about um, our teams at TTS is that um, we stay pretty busy. And, and that's no exception across government or even, um, even industry. But um, there were a few personal emergencies, and we were in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, you know, we, um, we were pretty impressed that people um, showed up and, and continued to show up. Um, we found that folks gained confidence with being able to spot accessibility issues on their own. And uh, one quote from someone is, uh, they said, this has vastly improved my testing, especially with opening up screen readers. And um, people told us that it was a good use of their time and asked us to keep continue doing the course. Um, you know, the, and they said, I like this class, I'm learning a lot. And, uh, and so we also heard constructive feedback. So um, uh, folks wanted to um, see the manual accessibility testing in the context of their own work. And, um, and we also heard an idea which, um, which, which we, um, we really liked, which was um, pairing cohort members together. So um, our class was eight, eight weeks long for one hour of classroom time. And we also gave folks about an hour of homework each week to do. So this was a pretty slow paced uh, course that, um, that we wanted people to be able to do within the context of their own work. So um, what we're doing now with that is, is we're, um, we've edited the course to incorporate what we learned in round one. Um, another thing that we learned is that folks in that eight weeks with basically about 16 hours worth of time invested, they didn't feel fully confident in being able to do a full audit. Um, so um, so we're, uh, we've added some explicit how to test sections within each lecture. So we have um, for every concept that we're teaching about, you know, here's what to understand about accessibility. We're also um, giving people, here's how you test this. Um, we've made homework assignments clearer. Um, we've paired people up for homework. And um, we've also decided uh, based on uh, the fact that doing a full WCAG audit is a, is a really um, intensive process that uh, we're ending the class at, um, at least the first class with testing a code change. And then we're gonna add um, additional classes to, to have a, a deeper dive around doing full WCAG audits. Um, so uh, we're, we're in a, um, a second cohort now and um, we're still, you know, taking this kind of iterative approach to adjusting things, learning what works best, how are people using this, um, and, um, and how we can make the training better. Um, so what we're um, essentially doing is, is um, you know, taking people from this place of good intentions, and we're, we're giving them skills to, uh, and knowledge to be able to test the code change before it gets checked in and audit key workflows for their product. It may not be the, um, the, full, um, the full range of, uh, of uh, WCAG testing, but it's, uh, it's getting people there. Uh, and here's a, an image of uh, our class yesterday. Actually, I asked them if we could throw this into today's presentation. So at, uh, uh, this is from our Zoom uh, meeting and we have uh, Dan Williams from the US Web Design System 
in the top left. I'm in the um, uh, top center, and there's uh, Matt, Matt Dobson um, in the top right, uh, Davida Marion in the um, middle left, Mitchell Hinky from login.gov. Oh, Davida is 18F. Mitchell Hinky is uh, login.gov. Dave Ludiger uh, from uh, 18F, uh, Jessica Demby from login.gov, and Nikki Lee, who is uh, my uh, co-lead on the uh, on the course. So everyone's giving some sort of pose, mostly smiling, maybe with a black cat. Davida and Nikki have black cats. We try to have fun with it, but but it's really serious business. We're we're really trying to make this um, something where folks uh, understand. Um, uh, the accessibility principles. So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, just basically incorporate inclusive design within teams thinking and processes. And, uh, you know, it's only part of the story though. Um, so we, you know, our goal is we want people to move beyond designing for people with disabilities. And, and we, we want them uh, to design with people with disabilities because the, the, the most valuable usability insights happen when we're designing with people with disabilities. So, um, so that's where I wanna turn, um, turn this over to, uh, to Ben Peterson to talk about inclusive research. And we are on slide 53 now. Thanks Robert. Um, this is uh, Ben Peterson speaking. Um, I'm gonna go quickly so we can have some time for uh, questions. Um, and I'm gonna just briefly share some ingredients for inclusive research we're thinking about at TTS. Um, 54, please. So uh, respecting your participants' time by checking as many accessibility issues you can before testing with people. So they're not doing a basic accessibility scan for you or telling you something you can find out without a testing session. Um, next slide, we're on uh, 55. Um, conduct research with accessibility in mind. Use live prototypes when possible, which allow people using assistive technologies to interact with your design. Um, writing your discussion guides, uh, be as inclusive as possible. Um, in your directions to participants, can you say things like activate instead of click on to account for different ways of accomplishing a task? and um, Focus on your highest priority tasks so you can um, learn from participants' experience um, without making tests longer. Um, for some folks, you might need to budget more time for, for a task. Um, and um, set expectations ahead of the session by letting folks know about the accessibility issues they'll, they'll run into and uh, the content you'll be covering. Um, slide 56, please. Um, Sorry, uh, can we go one, two more? Yeah, I'm just cutting cutting some for time. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so um, when we're we're trying to be inclusive in our in our um, research, can we think about um, schedule how can we uh, meet people where they are by meeting outside of normal business hours uh, can we accommodate part participants preferences um, for where to meet or what kind of technical setup they need and um, you know how might folks feel about the government um, are there issues that you can address ahead of time as part of an outreach discussion uh, next slide and um, recruiting practices. Uh, when we're talking about recruiting, we're talking about engaging uh, as diverse a group of participants with a range of different abilities that will help you understand a full picture of the friction your design creates for everyone. And uh, taking it a step further, can you recruit more than one person um, who has similar abilities to avoid solely on one person's experience of an issue or potentially tokenizing that experience? Um, next slide. Um, and so that said, um, at TTS, um, some of our common recruiting practices are preventing us from achieving this diversity. Um, you know, we commonly recruit for research through our personal networks and uh, with uh, recruitment platforms. And uh, this limits us when we recruit with our own network. We tend to get folks who have similar backgrounds to us. And uh, when we use a third-party recruiter, 
uh, we're limited to their pool of people that they're connected with. Um, we're just starting to test working with community groups to see if we can build relationships with them. And uh, just with recruiting agencies, uh, we'll pay a fee for their time to help with the recruiting. And in this way, we'd get research participants who are representative of the communities we're trying to reach and support the work of those uh, community organizations at the same time. So working with community groups has been years in the making for us um, and has been a collective effort of dozens of people, uh, many of whom are, have moved on from 18F. Um, these things take time and require investment, but they're conversations worth having um, if, we're, if we're serious about uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, so we're on slide 58 now. If we could move to the next. Thanks. Um, so we're also asking ourselves, what power do we have uh, in the process and how can we share our power with our participants? Can we exist solely as facilitators of the process and put decision-making directly in the hands of the people who these designs are for and who will ultimately have to be using them? And uh, moving to slide 50 um, or 61, excuse me. Um, so one decision that might be within your power is when to include participants in your work. Uh, the earlier in the process, the better chance you have of meeting their needs. Um, can you bring participants in before you start building to help you frame your research plan and your design hypotheses? Think about like, if the prototype you're testing, is that the best way to meet the goals of your users? Um, you know, if you brought them in ahead of time, what would they wanna test? Um, and um, next slide. So the two questions that I'd like us to sort of like leave this session with thinking about is how are we measuring success and what power do we have to change our work? As designers, what parts of this process do we control or influence? And can we measure our success by how we share our power and how we make our practices more inclusive? 